Welcome to Flowcast. I'm your host, Jeremiah Washington. If you're like me, you've probably wondered what Catholic sisters might do with 164 acres of land, a few llamas, and alpacas, and some chickens. You're about to find out. I invite you to meet sisters Rose Marie Riley, Sharon Zayak, Anita Cleary, and Suzanne Donner. The sisters will talk about what it means to care for Jubilee Farm. That's their community's ecology and spirituality center on West Edge of Springfield. You are in for a treat. Well, I'm very happy to be uh, part of this conversation about Jubilee Farm. My name is Sister Rosemary Riley, and my title is director. And I like to think that that means I'm doing the nuts and bolts pieces so that all of the creativity of our team can shine and that there's time for people to shine with their gifts. I'm a sister Suzanne Donner. Um, I work at Jubilee Farm and I'm the gardener there. And um, I also uh, do some plants, some plant work and so on. Um, I'm at, I've been at Jubilee Farm, I think, probably close to almost 18 or 19 years, and I do love it very much. I'm Sister Sharon Zayak. Um, I'm a member of the community here at Jubilee Farm, and I have been here since its inception in 1999. I do a number of things. I can share those also in a few moments when we begin to talk about what Jubilee Farm really is and what it's about. I'm Anita Clary, one of the Dominican sisters out at Jubilee Farm. I'm also one of the co-foundresses here. Um, so I've worn many hats over the years. I guess I'd like to say that um, I'm the new kid on the block. I'm beginning my fourth year here. And so for me in this position as director, um, it's really been a learning curve, um, and I depend on everyone else who is here and has been here for so many years to guide me, to teach me, um, and to give me space, as I hope to give them space, to be creative, draw your creativity in, because we're surrounded with this beautiful, beautiful nature, which is always creating and teaching us and always has energy. And so uh, it's a gift that we share as we share the gift of the land with others. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to say, what do we do here? We get that question a lot. We live here. <laughs> We're part of the community of life here. And so it's not a matter of, well, I do this thing and Suzanne does this thing and Anita does this thing. It's, um, you know, we have the responsibility to care for the animals that um, that are here at Jubilee Farm, um, our companions on the journey, we like to say. We have gardens, uh, produce gardens, so that means we do a lot of planting and weeding and prepping and freezing and eating. Um, we always have visitors coming out to to find out about who we are and why we're here, and so a lot of time is spent with them. Um, so there are a lot of the day-to-day -day things everybody does in their own homes, plus what, what is extra because of the fact that we do are open to the public. And, um, and then also what, what we are and who we are as we, as we try to learn and, and grow in, um, in our relationship with the whole life, the whole earth community life here. So it's, like I said, it's, it's, I think it's, it's hard for me to, to answer the question, well, what do you do? Part of what we do is enjoy the beauty of each day. Maybe it's the sunrise, it's picking apples early in the morning, or seeing the dew on top of the pumpkins, or pausing to pet a cat that just rolls over right in front of you and wants attention in the moment. Um, there's many invitations to see creativity and beauty, and God's expression of love and light. One of the things that um, I 
really like about the farm that I do is the growing of flowers, produce, herbs from seed. I truly believe that when I see this being done, like in our greenhouse, we do have a greenhouse. To me, it's a miracle. It's a miracle to me of the potential of what these seeds have. And to see what becomes of them is just um, a meditation to me. Uh, so that's one of the things that I love. I do come early in the morning because I don't live at the farm. I do live at the mother house, but I do come early in the morning. And to see the sunrise and eventually as the cats come out, as Sister Anita mentioned and so on, they, they greet you. But um, part, a lot of what I do is the, uh, the creation of the, of the gardens there and the the working with the seeds and and the potential of those seeds i was thinking in our vision statement we say one of the reasons jubilee farm is here is to share the gift of the land and when people come for the first time and we might be showing them where the trails are where the paths are and we welcome that people to come and enjoy the land so often we'll hear them say there's such peace here. Well, it's creation, you know, and we're in the midst of it and we are part of it, but we're surrounded here. Um, and I think because of the fact that we're trying to keep the land as it should be without the chemicals, restoring the land and so forth, there's a certain energy in the earth here and um, an openness to God's life everywhere, the animals that we try to protect and so forth. And so people do come here because it feeds something within, something of our heart's longings. And especially during the time of COVID, when we had to um, shut down our activities and so forth, we felt that what we could offer to people was to come here and walk, bring your children in. Let them run the trails and so forth because there's so much space and uh, people continue to do that. And it, those encounters feed us. I know they feed me and give me energy. Um, that's what we want, to share the gift of the land. You know, Rosemary, that's one of the things I think I've learned over the last 22 years here is um, there is a real energy here. It's a real healing energy. And I can't count the number of times that visitors have said to me, I feel, I feel the peace here. I feel the energy. It's got such good energy. There are such good vibes here. <clears throat> and I've learned over the years to, um, to allow myself to become part of that, that flow and energy. And I think I see it mostly in the turn of the seasons. I have never been as attentive to seasons as before, uh, you know, when I lived elsewhere. Um, and I've come to really appreciate and understand the four seasons and surprisingly have come to love the season of winter the most. And that was always my least favorite season. But there's a real different energy in the land during during the winter, and there's a there's a restfulness and a and a silence that comes that I just find myself craving more and more. In the past, I would have always said I hate winter. It's not that I hated the cold; I hated the fact that everything turned brown and it died. And there was I thought there was no beauty in that. But now I see a real beauty. I never would have learned that if I hadn't have not have had the experience of living here at Jubilee Farm. Some of the beauty and creativity is indoors too with new um, students with spinning and weaving or studying Spanish or learning different things in the kitchen to see the same piece that people experience outdoors being um, on the indoors with learning how to weave for the first time or actually doing some spinning and the threads hold together. Um, so the piece is both outside and inside 
just like with nature, it's outside of us and inside of us. And so there's many ways of sharing it with others. Some of the first animals that joined us on the farm um, were llamas. And in an attempt to try to learn to begin to understand what sustainability might mean, um, we attempted to cut the llama's fiber on our own and have since learned to hire a professional for that. But with using the llama fiber, that's with having the fiber, that's when I learned um, how to spin. And my teacher was learning how to weave at that point. And that was something I had no interest in and had no thought of learning to do that. But then the looms and spinning wheels started showing up as people donated them as they cleaned them from basements and attics. And so since the things were coming, then I felt responsibility for learning how to use them. And since I was such a beginner, I'm able to use, remember what it was like to be a beginner with all this and to share that with new students who come. So we have spinning events, um, usually one in September and a larger weaving event in November, but also again, bringing creation into the story. There's spinning and weaving retreats where individuals weave or spin their stories, spin their charism, spin the story of earth, whatever is are the things most important to them. And then they leave with yarn or, or a piece of cloth that represents who they are. So there's many different ways of, of bringing all the stories of the land, of our personal stories and journeys, and bringing them into something that's beautiful and tangible. Well, I'd like to talk about the fact of, um, Sister Anita mentioned, you know, um, how she brings people into the weaving. Um, I've had people come onto the farm to ask me about what we do as far as not using any type of pesticides, insecticides, or herbicides. And we do have um, a compost area where we compost. And uh, one of the things also that I found very interesting is many plants have what they call companions. And companion planting, okay, is where you help another plant and the other plant helps that plant. So if you were planting tomatoes, okay, on the other side maybe of the tomatoes, you would plant basil because those two are good companion plant plants. And the reason behind this is because of the fact that the insects that are drawn to either the tomato or the basil are the good insects, or they try to keep the bad insects away, and so on. So you don't have to use pesticides or insecticides or herbicides to take care of the plant. And I found this with many, many things. So people seem to be very interested in how to use these um, combinations to actually grow organically and not grow and not have to, to use these um, uh, chemicals, you know, on your plants. So um, I find that I find that myself very interesting and sort of the people that come on the land, especially the people who buy plants. They ask me a lot of questions. I, I, I do sell seedlings and plants and they ask me questions about how can I take care of this or what can I could what, what can I grow next to this plant? I think what um, sisters Suzanne and Anita are pointing out is the educational component, which is very much a part of the farm here. And um, so Sharon, I thought maybe you'd wanna share the educational components that you're part of. Well, actually, as I was listening to Sister Suzanne speak, I was smiling because, you know, um, a lot of people say, or presume that those of us who live and work out here grew up on farms or we come from farming background. And actually, none of us in the 22 years that have ever been out here lived on a farm. And what we've learned, besides looking things up, you know, on the internet or in books, but what we've learned is by watching earth. Um, you plant a seed, and then you watch, and you learn from earth herself um, what to do and what not to do. 
because it's all about relationships and interrelationships. And over the years, that really has been the focus of our education here, our relationship to the land, and that we are part of the earth community. So for many years, and I still do some of this, but for many years, um, I did a number of programs on ecological issues, on water and food and genetically modified foods and uh, climate change, which I'm still doing quite a bit on. Um, and then really my focus, even though it's still there, um, has really shifted to, to speak to people about relationship and about who we are in this, this greater cosmic journey and what this, our new understanding of who we are in relationship to the whole, what it really means for us, what the implications are for our faith. Uh, what the implications are for our life. So I've had the opportunity, I've had some wonderful opportunities to do this, not only across the United States, but even um, in some very lovely places around the world. And uh, it, it evolved into presenting programs into actually leading retreats now. And I have found over the years a real hunger, a real yearning for people to understand that they are connected. I mean, we know that sort of, well, no, we don't really know that in our heads. I think we know it really deep inside us. We just need permission to, um, to know that what we believe really is true. We, we are connected to the whole. And so that really has become the major part of my role here at Jubilee Farm. It has shifted over the years. And now that Sister Rosemary is director, I've got more time to spend on developing and researching and getting involved in projects I never thought I'd get involved in, um, in, in educating people, but also in, in assisting them on their own personal spiritual journeys to wholeness. And so much of that follows through with the individual spiritual direction. The land has so much to teach. Um, I'll never forget the first time a spiritual director said to me to go out on the land and look for examples of forgiveness where the land has teaches us how to forgive. And I felt like I walked for hours until I found examples of new life um, in an area that had been flooded over. And so it's things like that that I try to bring to the bilingual spiritual direction ministry, or even, you know, our hands have so much to teach us. We have so many different types of hands and people will come and see all the different colors and say, and they all get along. So there's so, the land has so much to teach us and each in our own way. Um, I think that's what we try to share with others. Rose, uh, Rosemary, I think maybe our listeners would like to hear about the bird banding. Sure, I'm happy to share the story. Um, we are blessed to be one of the sites that the Lincoln Land Association of Bird Banders uses. And uh, this year, for the first time, they've been coming for several weeks in the spring every week and now in the fall every Tuesday morning. Um, and they're studying, it's a, a national study on migratory patterns of birds. And so we're in the change of seasons here. Birds are migrating. And um, I cannot begin to say how beautiful these creatures are um, as they gently um, land in a miss net and then are brought to the banding site and we can see them up close we can hold them to let them go and the bird that uh, Suzanne's referring to was one that was just captured yesterday an American red start yeah. and uh, I would just encourage people to look it up American red start gorgeous black bird with bright orange um, on its wings and um it's just an, it's a spiritual experience and anyone who comes to observe to be part of it. Again, it's that longing that we have to feel that connection to creation and uh, what a blessing it is 
to have that happen right here on our grounds and to see the birds that otherwise we just wouldn't see. They're up in the trees and so forth and hidden. But um, it's an awesome experience. And to see the um, two things amaze me the most about this bird banding thing. And one is that, you know, you look at a bird from a distance and you say, oh, there's a brown bird. Well, now that we see them up close and personal, there's no such thing as a brown bird. They have the most amazing colors in their feathers. All of the birds are, are really beautiful. But what I love is the fact that some of the birds that stop here at Jubilee Farm have come from Central and South America and are on their way up to the boreal forest in Canada, or now they're reversing their journey and going back home. But it's like, oh my gosh, of all the places they stopped on their way, they stopped here at Jubilee Farm. I did, it's just, um, it's amazing. It's just amazing to me. And they come back. Yeah. We have had yeah. caught birds that have been banded before who travel from Central America or South America, and they come back here, get captured again. And so we know um, this is their stopping place, and they come every year. Yeah. It's, it's pretty in- exciting. Creation and that's, is awesome. Yeah. And so that's part of it. It's like, you know, you think, oh, we've just got ordinary land. There's no such thing as ordinary land. There are so many amazing things, so many wonderful things happening um, just, just right before us, right around us that we're usually never even aware of. Now, I'd like to bring up another thing. One of the challenges is how do we sustain the land, not only by uh, restoration and so forth, but financially, how do we keep um, Jubilee Farm going? And um, this year we're making lemonade out of lemons because the COVID um, has certainly dampened our abilities to hold events inside. And we always have an annual holiday craft fair, which we had to cancel last year. And so we put our heads together and Rather than canceling our holiday craft fair in December because it'd be too many people in a small space, we decided to extend the craft fair over a series of weeks. So we're just working on that. We'll be getting the information out soon. But it's uh, one way when if life gives you lemons, just put them to good use and um, So we're hoping that we'll see more people this way and that it will still be a safe way to support the farm and to um, buy some wonderful pottery, weavings, uh, gift baskets of all occasions. And a couple of days we will be having the bake sale, which is always a popular part of our holiday craft fair. So more information will be coming out soon. Well, there are a number of ways to um, find Jubilee Farm. We have a Facebook page, The Jubilee Farm. Uh, We're also on the web, jubileefarm.info. Give us a call, 217-787-6927. Now, our address, we're located on Old Jacksonville Road. Yeah, 6760 Old Jacksonville Road. Our address, mailing address is New Berlin, but we're more Springfield. We're 3.8 miles west of Veterans Parkway. So um, just give us a call if you want to come and walk. We just ask, call us. Tell us how many are in your party, uh, what time you'll be here, and the color of your car. And then you're welcome to come and enjoy the gift of the land. Or if you're out driving around and you happen to see us, you can stop. Um, We have a parking area and we do ask you still to call us. Those really came about because of COVID. Before we just asked you to come to our door. (laughs) Now we ask you to give a phone call. Um, But there are a lot of things that you can do. We have walking trails. We have benches where you can sit. We have an outdoor labyrinth that's totally natural. If you're familiar with labyrinths, a lot of people are. And in fact, we're on the international register for um, labyrinths. You can can look us up. 
Uh, we have um, the Creative Arts Center, where um, if any of us are, are available, we can give you a tour. Uh, you can sit and sit by the pond and watch our llama and alpacas. Um, they're too old to romp around anymore, but they're out there for you to watch. Um, hens that we've mentioned, uh, they're always a hit with the younger children. We also have a, a creek that runs through our farm and we have a bridge uh, that was built uh, for, for people to walk um, you know, uh, uh, across the creek. And then there's also a path that leads into um, some wood, wooded areas which um, I find very interesting and so on. And I think people find very interesting. And for um, individuals, couples, friends, looking for a quiet weekend, a, a getaway place, we have a lovely house called La Casa, the house. Um, three bedrooms, fully equipped kitchen, living room, dining room, which can be rented for a weekend, a week's retreat. And again, those arrangements are made through a simple phone call. Just give us a call. I guess um, as I listen to us talking about all of this, there's something for everyone here, especially for your heart's longings. It's a, a place to come and sit and listen to the longing of your heart. Listen to the sounds of creation. Um, there's something here that's part of your story. Well, Rosemary was talking about the bird banding, and we do have a lot of wildlife here at Jubilee Farm. Most of the time they stay very quiet and, and stay to themselves, which wildlife tends to do anyway. I mean, we certainly have a lot of deer, we have foxes, we have coyotes, we have all kinds of, of turtles, alligator turtles, um, an amazing array of wildlife. But we also have hens. We have uh, the llama and alpacas. Um, the size of our little herd is, has changed over the years, but they've always been part of the education here, especially the, the llamas. When you talk about a relationship to the land, we humans don't live on the land by ourselves. You know, we're, we're part of a, of a community. And actually, we've always said the, the llamas and alpacas have been part of our PR because people will drive by and see them and go, oh, and they'll stop and they'll say, what do you do with them? And then you can talk about the fact we don't do anything with them. They are companions on the land because land does need larger animals. Um, but they also are very generous in, in sharing their fiber with us. With the hens, it was um, because of the eggs. But that's not why we have them. Actually, they also are part of the education. The hens, Anita mentioned it earlier. We have, you know, we used to have about 14 varieties of hens, beautiful, beautiful colors, all different colors. And that in itself was a teaching to people. Um, what she mentioned earlier is true. I Several times we would show, and these were adults looking at these animals and saying, oh my, they're all different. They all get along. Um, so we have found that by sharing the, the, the presence of the animals, there are a lot of ways, again, that we can talk about our relationship with a broader community of life. And they're fun. They're fun. They're beautiful animals. And, and we've learned so much from them. We, we, have, we have a children's garden. And there are several things that the children can look at and sit down and enjoy. But we're, we, we started to uh, try to produce a butterfly garden for the children. And um, hopefully we can get a little more of that for, for next year when the children come in to learn about pollinators and butterflies and um, some of the different uh, dragonflies that we have. I, I call the dragonflies fairies <laughs> they look like fairies to me and they're all different kinds one looks like a little miniature helicopter okay that seems to be going around and so on some are um where you can see through the wings and things like that so and all the different kinds of bees and we do have beehives okay on the farm also to help with uh, helping with the uh, uh the produce and so on so um and then uh, 
uh, like I said, all of those things are, besides the regular animals that we have, all of those things in nature, the insects, the birds, um, the caterpillars, all of that the children can and, and adults can take a look at when they come. And that really is, um, that's part of our whole um, learning with our restoration project. Uh, and actually all that simply means is that we're trying to remove a lot of the invasive species that have come in that have prevented native Illinois wildflowers and grasses from, from growing. The seeds, those native seeds have been in the soil for, for decades and couldn't grow because of all of the invasives. And, and so we've been working to remove them through periodic burns, through mowing, not using chemicals, and now, um, especially in the back areas, we have an amazing proliferation of native wildflowers and grasses that have brought back pollinators that we've not seen on this land any time that we've lived here. So we have no, long, no idea how long it's been since some of the pollinators um, have actually been able to, to live here because their particular bushes or their particular plants, um, you know, weren't growing. So. Um, we and actually that brings up a whole other subject that that we have um, worked with uh, the University of Illinois in Springfield and Lincoln Land Community College to get students out here to be either part of the restoration projects or to actually do projects out here. We had a master's student from the university several years back who did a master's project for which she won an award on what was a small pond that we have determined, she actually determined, is a small wetlands. So we have the opportunity to share what's happening out here at Jubilee Farm for, um, for students to come out and to learn. One of the, one question we would get from some people was when they would see our llamas, they would say, so why do you have llamas? They are not native to the United States. Yeah. And um, so we would talk about why we need large animals, you know, as companions on the land. But actually, llamas were native to the United States. Um, 10,000 years ago, before the last ice age, camels and llamas and then that whole family, uh, the camelid family, were native animals here in North America. And it was the ice age, as the ice age began to progress, of course, the, the ice and the cold just moved them down further and further and further until they ended up in the Andes in, in South America. And the camelid um, family died out in North America. So I, you know, jokingly said, well, we're just bringing them back to their original habitat. But there's that connection too. So there really is a connect. There, everything is connected. One of the projects I work on is weaving shrouds or repurposing old tablecloths and sheets and bedspreads that were woven years ago with natural materials. None of the unnatural dyes is using these different materials to make shrouds for green burials. And green burials are another option for burials, the, there's the um, like bamboo boxes or or the natural wooden boxes, um, or another way of showing respect for the land that has sustained us all the all of our life. Um, it's a way of being buried without the formaldehyde and all the chemicals, and so with the shrouds. Um, they're woven using natural products, usually cotton and linen. There's a variety of different colors available now that are have been, been dyed with with all natural dyes. So there's a, we can use um, your typical colors that you see in your brown and green cottons, but we're now able to also to add in um, the reds and blues and greens with yarn that's been made um, sustainably. Also with the repurposing of the shrouds, um, with there's so many um, folks who come out with saying, I have my grandma's um, 
linens from Italy. I have no idea what to do with it. My family's not so big anymore. What can I do? And so um, I've been working with some different materials that are from the 1800, late 1800s, 1900s. Um, some are stained, so try to work around the stains. And other times, just let the stains be, because that's part of life, too. We weave the shrouds and also repurpose different materials to make into shrouds for green burials. I would just like to say um, to anyone listening, um, if you happen to be in this area, please give us a call. Stop by. We'll show you where the trails are. Or, um, give you a tour of our Creative Arts Center and so forth. Just know that you are welcome. Hope to see you soon. Thank you for listening. Yes, please, please come out. Give yourself the gift of time on the land. Thank you to sisters Rose Marie Riley, Sharon Zayak, Anita Cleary, and Suzanne Donner for this enlightening conversation about the gift of the land at Jubilee Farm. Find the resources the sisters mentioned and learn how you can enjoy or volunteer at Jubilee Farm on our website, flowcastlisten.org. I'm Jeremiah Washington. Stay blessed.